We are in a series going through the book of Genesis uh, right now, a large book of the Bible as far as space and time and words and chapters, uh, but a quick synopsis, sort of a thumbnail uh, to kind of give you a grasp of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going uh, is that uh, Genesis can be summarized by four events and four individuals or people. If you remember these four events, you remember these four people. It's a story about God, obviously, and how he is redeeming mankind to himself. But the four events at the beginning of the book are the creation, the fall, the flood, and we've covered those. And today we're looking at the tower, that is the tower of of Babel. And the four individuals we'll get into next week a narrative story about their lives Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But before we get into the passage of scripture in Genesis, to kind of give you a thought of where we're going with the title of today's message, I wanted to give a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter number three. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. So we see contrasting ideas there in the Word of God. And it reminds us that as the people of God, we need to pray for spiritual discernment and exercise wisdom in regards to each situation in where we, where we find ourselves, okay? Because uh, not one answer is not necessarily always the right answer. So with that passage of Scripture in mind, we come to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, and I beg you to pray for me this morning. We did it in the 9 a.m., and we're going to do it again at the 10.30, but we're going over two complete chapters of the Bible. And the title of the message is A Time to Unite... And a time to divide. And when we consider the words of Genesis and we think about the big event of the Tower of Babel, uh, we want to provide some insight, hopefully, into two questions. Uh, the two questions that I pose this morning one, when is it right to divide? And the second, why should we unite? Now, we're going to read the entirety of Genesis chapter number 10. It's a genealogy, and sometimes we come to places in the Bible, uh, especially a place like 1 Chronicles, where there are chapters upon chapters of genealogies. And I think that sometimes we believe this to be an unprofitable. However, uh, the genealogies provide us great use. And the genealogy in chapter number 10 gives us at least four reasons why it is useful. One is it gives us a true account of the origin of several nations of the world and how the whole earth was populated and overspread. Second, it discovers and distinguishes God's people who were to be preserved from others throughout the earth. Third, it explains and confirms Noah's prophecy concerning his sons and fourth, and this is very strong, and one reason why the genealogies are in the Bible, is they help us to understand other parts of Scripture. Remember, all of the written and revealed Word of God is useful for us. With that said, I'm going to read rather rapidly, or give an attempt to do that with these difficult names, but I hope as well reverently and make a couple of uh, points from Genesis chapter number 10. Feel free to follow along on your screen or our screen, however you choose to do that. Or if you have a book Bible, you can open that as well and read with us too. 
These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madi, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rephath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each one with his own language by their clans in their nation. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, Sabtika. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Cani, the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kela, and Resen between Nineveh and Kela. This is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludum and Ananamon and Lahibam and Nephtuam and Pathrusim and Kasluhim for whom the Philistines came and calf tore him. So let's stop right there and let's have a corporate time of prayer as we continue with these thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and how every part of your word, every section has importance for us. And I pray that you would give us insight and direction. Help me to speak clearly. And may your word transform our lives to be more of what you have desired of your children. I thank you for all who are here, either in the seats or on the broadcast. And we pray that your blessing would abide on each one. If anyone doesn't know Christ as their Savior, may today be their day of salvation. And for the redeemed, may we be built up in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... So we run into a name here, Nimrod. Now, I remember when I was a kid, sometimes I get mad at somebody and call them a Nimrod, and, but I didn't really know about the Bible character uh, or who that is all about. And Nimrod is listed as someone who kind of eclipsed his family. He was a renowned man, and he was distinguished because he was a hunter. Uh, most people were uh, of the pastoral field. That is, they would look over the livestock, or they were farmers. But Nimrod made his his claim to fame as someone who went out and hunted. Now it has been suggested, and it's probably true, that as he hunted animals and he grew in his pride, his arrogancy, his desires, he could have also turned into a serial killer or a tyrant in that he was like taking over and anyone who was not happy with the way he was running things or his uh, monarch type of style and kingdom, he would just slaughter them. And it seems that he founded the first kingdom in the world. If you remember back in Genesis chapter number 9, the beginning, we saw that uh, God, when Noah came out of the ark, God allowed human government. He gave that uh, in, in the, the historical context, in that covenant with Noah, he allowed human government, and it seems that Nimrod now starts his own kingdom, and it was called Babel. So, kind of leans into here where we are, and 10 is giving us some backdrop moving into chapter 11. So he laid this foundation, uh, whether or not he had fitness for good government, he certainly ruled, if you will, with the rod of iron or the bully pulpit. pulpit. Now, uh, the idea is we find people always wanting to establish their own universal or independent sovereignty. And that's what Nimrod is doing. It says he's a mighty hunter before the Lord, but the name uh, for Lord there, it's not that he was serving the God of all gods, of, of all creation, but rather uh, idols. Okay, And the proud, proud nations and people worship idols. And let this be known in his time. Sometimes it's not as quickly as we think it should be or it's protracted. God humbles proud nations. Now, I travel with an American passport. I love my country. I'm thankful to be an American. But I'm wondering if in some way is God seeking to humble you and me and our nation right now. Verse 15. 
Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar, as far as Gaza, and the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam, Zeboam, and as far as Lacia. So we see, we, you've heard of some of these places, right? You're finding out how these came about now. Verse 20, these are the sons of Ham by their clans and their languages, their lands and their nations. Verse 21, to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born, the sons of Shem, Elam, Aser, Arpaxad, Lud, and Aram, the sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpaxad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber, and Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almodad, Shelah, Hazarmaveth, and Jera. So here we find another guy with something different spoken about him. We learned about Nimrod, now we're told about Peleg. And Peleg is uh, remarkable in the account that it says, in his days was the land divided. So that at least gives us two questions. Well, how was the land divided and what does it mean by in his days? Uh, most commentators and Bible students are in agreement that when Peleg was around, when he was alive, this is actually when the occurrence of the Tower of Babel happened. The earth was divided because languages, different languages, originated. God confused the languages. We understand that from the Tower of Babel. And for some reason, Peleg was an instrumental figure there. Now, why was he instrumental in this? Uh, there are two different ideas. One is that maybe he was an adult who was leading a charge uh, with the Tower of Babel. Maybe he was a, a very central figure in the building of the tower. That's a possibility, but one that I do not tend to uh, lean towards. I would say it's more likely that he was born at that time or during that confusion fusion of languages and his mother and father named him Peleg to remember our son was born when the earth was divided uh, it divided in their tongues and their languages because many people in the eastern world they will name their children based upon the circumstances or situations that are going on at that time verse 27 Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Aubal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Jobab. These are the sons of Joktan, the territory which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephir to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nation. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So we find the nation spreading actually doing what God had said at the beginning when they came out of the ark. But as we get into chapter 11, we understand it wasn't of their own free will, if you will. It wasn't of their own choosing that they decided to spread out. We're going to skip over the Tower of Babel section and get back to that. But we're getting into another genealogy. Uh, this genealogy is repeated because it's the genealogy of Shem from whom comes Abraham. And this all leads toward Jesus Christ, the promised seed, who was the son of Noah. So the word of God and especially the Holy Spirit in giving the scripture is telling us the importance of the history of Abraham because we find the people as is the character of people refusing to serve God. They're refusing to do what God had asked them to do. They're refusing his call. They're refusing his command. And God is now calling through Shem and later Abraham. Throughout that lineage, God is bringing about redemption of the refusers. God brings redemption to the refusers. Verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. 
Shem was 100 years old. He fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah lived 30 years, he fathered Eba. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu. 209 years and had other sons and daughters. So the genealogies, important. There's a purpose for them. God redeeming refusers. And now in verses 1 through uh, 8 or 9, we now see the Tower of Babel, that, that whole picture and that whole idea. And we're familiar with this story, and we ask ourselves, how does this work in unity and in division for us practically? Verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said one to another, come, let us make bricks, burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. In verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. So, there's two things at least happening here with the people. When Noah and his boys came off the ark, he said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish the earth. That carries with it an idea of spreading out. Somebody said in the 9 a.m. service today, I thought it was very appropriate. Uh, he said the new motto for fellowship is going to be, let's get together so we can spread out. Amen. So that's kind of where we are right now. And uh, we will be getting to communion. Uh, just keep that there close uh, to you. I failed to mention that uh, we will be partaking of communion together in just a little bit. So, God says, I want you to replenish and multiply, and I want you to fill the earth. But what did they do? Instead of obeying God's call and His command and doing His will, they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make our name great. Well, God never calls a person to make His name great. God seeks to make His own name great through people. He's a jealous God. He's jealous of his glory. He's the one who's worthy. He's deserving. Jesus is the name above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We are to be reflectors of his glory. But they said, let us make us a great name for all our posterity that we might be remembered. One of the great errors of pagan religions and heathen doctrines is the idolizing and the worship and the remembrance of human beings. And the second thing is, they wanted to prevent their dispersion. Now, I understand it. You know, I understand sometimes why things happen, and you don't have to agree just to understand. I mean, could you imagine how these people were feeling? I think they were afraid to spread out because here this creator God had just destroyed the whole earth and executed all living creatures on the earth. They're like, if I spread out, I make God mad, he's going to kill me. All right. Now, that's an unhealthy fear of God. We talked about the fear of God before, and there, there's a, a healthy way to fear God. And that fear of God is the fear that drives you to Him, and you're, you're afraid to be away from Him. But the, another fear of God is that you're afraid of God, and you don't ever get close to Him. That's an unhealthy fear of God. And uh, some demands and workings of religion have caused people to view God in that manner. Manner. So they wanted to make themselves a name, and they did not want to be spread out. So they're building this tower for wherever they are. They could, it could be a, a, a vantage point of, in view, and they like, as long as we can see the tower, we can get back to the city. Well, the funny thing is, as they build this high tower, God says, let me come down and look at that. And that's an intentional 
play on words in the Holy Scriptures because as much as we try to reach the highness and our own individual sovereignty, I mean, as high as you might climb on any ladder or anything or any, any realm of remembrance, God comes down to look at us and He remembers that we are dust. They wanted to make this great name, this posterity, and they wanted to prevent their dispersion. They wanted to be united in one glorious empire. And the main fact is that the divine desire of the human being. Do you remember when Eve sinned? How did Satan tempt her? When you partake of this fruit... You will be like God. Man is ambitious and has this overriding dream of being sovereign in himself. There's one Lord, there's one potentate, there's one sovereign. And that's God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And any man, any woman who refuses to acknowledge his sovereignty and views himself or herself as independent from the laws of God and his overarching and far-reaching dominion will experience his wrath and destruction because we are dust and to dust we shall return It would be wise, advisable, and reasonable if you have not bowed your knee before the holy God creator of heaven and earth who sent Christ to die for your sins according to the scriptures. It would be good for you to do that right now. Because he is Lord. I am not, nor are you. And he shows man this. Man in all of his pride, his arrogancy and his strife against God is building this tower and God says, I'm going to go down and I'm going to confuse languages and I'm going to diversify their speech. And now you and I, we suffer the consequences of that because even if you speak English, how many uh, communication breakdowns have we had because, you know, We don't understand each other, even if we are using the same language or the same words. There's a confusion in the world and among men, a strife of words, a misunderstanding of language, a confusion of tongues. Verse number six, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us. He's not speaking to angels. Again, it's like when he created man in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Let us make man in our image. We are imago Dei, made in the image of God. And God says, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let's go down, confuse their language. So they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. God humbles the proud. Verse 9, Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So there is a divine interposition here. The Lord scattered them abroad. Well, how did, did God do it or did they, did they do it themselves? Well, the answer is yes. You know, sometimes we, we struggle with what's the will of God, you know, what I'm doing. Remember, he is sovereign. He is overseeing the councils 
and the affairs of life. All right. So the idea is that while they spread out, God did that, was doing that through the confusion of their speech. There was a diversity of interests. There was misunderstanding that naturally followed. And the misunderstanding got mistrust. And people who spoke the same languages ended up finding one another. Because when they were building that, and one of them said, Wait, wait, let the, let the heo, nio, heo, when you wake up, and he's saying, what is he talking about? Okay, So they're speaking different languages, and they don't understand each other so they each un- get unions and they go to these sequestered spots and they make these communities for themselves and that's why we now have over 7,000 languages in the world okay now the seven over 7,000 languages in the world they weren't all brought forth on the day that the Lord confused the languages of the Tower of Babel because linguists know that there are families of languages What is more likely is that a family of language was developed. And then from that family of language, other languages have come from that. And I am of the opinion, I don't have a strong theological leg, I guess, to stand on here. But I am of the opinion that as the languages changed, the ethnos, if you will, the relationship that people were having, that is also the time when appearances look so people looked the same and they spoke the same. And so they went and they migrated to their own areas. All right. Now when a, now thinking about that, the Tower of Babel and how they were united in that desire to build that tower. And then God divided them and spread them out. It stands sometimes some would ask, well, does God want us to unite or does he want us to divide? And again, the answer is yes. Both. The Lord Jesus said, think not that I am come on this earth to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. And he said, a son will be at variance against his father. A mother will turn against her daughter and families will be divided. Okay, so Christ did that. But he also asked for his church to be united. So that's why I want us to look at these two questions. One, when is it right to divide? Well, it's right to divide as a child of God when a situation or relationship is causing me to repeatedly stumble in my devotion to Christ. If I'm experiencing through a relationship or situation pride, arrogancy, strife, rebellion against God. If I'm sinning because I'm being being influenced in a contrarian way against what I know to be the revealed will of God for my life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, when he was giving uh, his dissertation to the church at Corinth on the resurrection. If you want to know anything about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 fully mentioned 58 verses of just wow, impactful information about the resurrection. So right there in 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 30 through 34... And why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead? And if there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. And then verse 33 Don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad company corrupts good character. It would be like, you know, they said, let's feast and drink. Tomorrow we die. Today we say, YOLO. (laughs) So think carefully about what's right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. So God says, if you're a believer, you need to understand that if you keep bad company... That could corrupt your good character. And it will. So there has to be a wisdom application here. And it's as we grow in the grace and maturity of our Savior. Admittedly, today, I've now been a believer for 30 years. 
I've learned a few things, not where I'm supposed to be, but thank God I'm not where I was. I can now have associations that I couldn't have when I was 19 years old because when I was 19, it would cause me to stumble. But now I can make an effort to have a relationship with someone and seeking to win them to Christ. So again, the answer is you're independently being spirit-led by God and is it affecting your relationship with Christ? If it is, you may need to divide that relationship for a season. Now, let me say, if you're married, that doesn't work, though, okay? You, you got to figure that one out, okay? B, when the truth of Scripture has been or is being continually compromised... So there comes a place, bless you, there comes a time and a place in the church where sometimes churches will apostatize. That is, they will fall from the doctrines of grace and principles of the Word of God, and they will begin to promote and practice heresy. Outright, abject, wrong teaching as it relates to the fundamental doctrines and influences of Scripture. If someone is a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, they can, uh, they can try to remain and bring it back, but it's highly unlikely once a church begins to delve into the heretical teachings that deny the fundamentals of the faith that they will ever swing back as a whole. In Romans 16, 17, Paul says, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught and avoid them. Fellowship Baptist Church continues to preach and teach the basic fundamental truths of Scripture as has been orthodoxly approved and promoted since the dawn of the church. And if you want to know what we believe, we even on our app, you open the Fellowship Baptist app, tap here to learn more what we believe, we put it right out there, okay? We believe the fundamental core doctrines of Scripture that are based off uh, the reforming five solas. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Sola Fide, by faith alone. Sola Gratia, by grace alone. Solus Christus, through Jesus Christ alone. And Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Church councils, preachers, Bible commentators, private revelation, or even a message allegedly from an angel or an apostle are not an original authority alongside the Bible in the sola scriptura approach. Scripture is self-authenticating, clear to the rational reader, and Scripture interprets Scripture, and it is. The final authority, to be the final authority of Christian doctrine and the premise of Fellowship Baptist Church. Do I have a witness in that this morning? And C, when do I, when do I divide? When's it right? When seeking to enter into a covenantal agreement with someone else. A covenantal agreement would be a marriage, a business, any contractual arrangement that binds a believer to an unbeliever, that's when it's right to divide. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, do not be unequally yoked. Okay, so there's 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 power in the union with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So I've got two daughters in here who know the Lord. And I'm like, you don't say, well, I want to marry him and get him saved. No, you're not. No. He needs to take that step first. All right? So Christians are not to be brought into an unequal union with unbelievers. That's when we divide. Why should we unite? Well, we should unite because there's a Trinitarian focus in unity. One, God, the Godhead, is unified. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A perfect picture of how God has ordained His people to live and be. One, 
we are to be united as a people of God because it's the Father's command. Now, here's an interesting thing. God divided the world, the rebellious, but what's he doing now? He's seeking to redeem men and women into the body of Christ. And we learn in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and onward that there will be every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every kindred present in heaven worshiping the Lord. Why? He's redeeming the refusers. He's bringing back as we go and we preach the gospel. Psalm 133 in verse 1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's God's command. It's our Savior's prayer. Jesus did and He is praying for us to be united. In John chapter 17 and verse 23. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity. But the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. It's the Father's command. It's the Savior's prayer. And it's the Spirit's mission. The Holy Spirit is working in and through us as the people of God that we might be unified. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. To God be the glory.